So today I'll spend some time on extreme imaging. So it's not so really extreme. So we tried really to uh, push the limits of the standard or the conventional imaging. And um, it was fun, actually. Uh, we had uh, quite good uh, results. And uh, at the end, we could say that we enlarged uh, the capabilities uh, of the neutron imaging and also um, uh, attracted more users coming uh, for uh, or or coming for neutron imaging or using neutron imaging for their scientific questions. So um, it's only my name here, Nikolai Karchilov, but uh, we are a small group at Helmholtz Centrum Berlin, uh, which is dealing with uh, imaging at, in, in general. And uh, I'll present our activities also uh, in, in relation to, uh, to uh, other applications which we have in the group. So um, I'm coming from Helmholtz Centrum Berlin. It is really a very nice area in the southwest part of Berlin. So we are uh, almost uh, the last uh, a building uh, uh, of uh, Berlin, so a few hundred meters uh, from our institute is, let's say, the border to Brandenburg and Potsdam. So you see that our campus is uh, really nicely located close to Wannsee. This is the Lake uh, Wannsee here around. So we have a golf place here. So you see that uh, uh, when you are visiting us, you should take your golf equipment uh, and uh, then we can use the golf place. So um, uh, actually uh, Helmholtz Society in Germany is, uh, has the duty or how to say is uh, uh, related to large scale facilities or take care of uh, large scientific scale facilities. And this is also the uh, goal or the purpose of our institute. So uh, we have two large scale facilities, uh, the scientific uh, or research reactor BR2 and uh, the synchrotron ring Bessie 2 which is around 20 kilometers away from our campus in Vanzi. So um, I'm speaking about two large scale facilities, but situation has changed uh, just uh, one and a half years ago uh, when uh, actually the reactor was shut down on 11th of December, 2019. So now we have only one facility, but uh, we continue still to be active in the, in the field as users at uh, other um, neutron sources like the uh, research reactor in Grenoble Island Institute or uh, uh, having experiments at FRM2 in Munich or some other facilities. So uh, this date 11th of December is, was quite uh, let's say important for us because our situation has changed rapidly as you can see in this graph so this is uh, the power, uh, the, the, the chart of the power of our research reactor, which uh, you see has changed at 14 um, uh, o'clock in the, in the afternoon, so at 2 p.m. So the reactor was shut down. And uh, with this, uh, uh, actually, we uh, just uh, changed our activities from operating a facility to be user at other facilities. So you should just keep, you keep this also in mind that uh, sometimes the situation has, can, can change really like this. I mean, uh, from 100 to zero, I mean, having uh, really uh, some uh, activity uh, in such fields, then uh, at some point it, it can change. Uh, so for us, uh, it was not uh, really, um, uh, uh, really, uh, uh, let's say, big uh, problem, because uh, we started uh, several years ago to uh, to discuss what we will do after that, and uh, for everybody of us was some solution. 
So uh, at the end, you can see that the staff or the scientists were not really very uh, depressed uh, from this uh, event. And uh, everybody from us uh, had uh, some uh, further uh, uh, solution for, for continuing of his career. For us, uh, it went in direction of Grenoble uh, ILM. So we were able to establish a joint research unit with, uh, uh, which is focused in neutron imaging. So together with partners from ILL and University um, uh, Alps of Grenoble. Uh, we established this research unit and the aim of this research unit is uh, to operate the existing imaging facility and also to plan a new uh, imaging facility with uh, much uh, better performance for the future. So uh, if we look uh, at our situation before shutting down the reactor, we uh, operated actually three uh, um, instruments at large scale facilities. Uh, and we, this is the Institute of Applied Materials at the Helmholtz uh, Centrum Berlin, where the imaging is actually the main uh, experimental method uh, used for investigation. So we used uh, neutrons from our research reactor before, but uh, in um, uh, how to say in relation to this, we had also, uh, we are having activities uh, of uh, using X-rays for tomography and also we are participating at the tomography beam line at the synchrotron source in Berlin. So uh, here you can see some uh, pictures from the, from the three facilities. And uh, here today I'll concentrate uh, on in the activities which we had at the neutron tomography facility at the research reactor from 2012 to 2019. Uh, so um, uh, here I would like to show uh, some statistics which we had at the facility just to get some impression. Uh, what is the uh, what are the applications which uh, usually uh, we have at such facilities? So you see that uh, the main stream or the main um, part of experiments were related to material science and uh, energy science. We had some geo applications, life science, cultural heritage, and uh, some uh, fundamental uh, science uh, related to magnetism. So um, actually, in the in the in these uh, seven years of operation, uh, we were quite successful, and a lot num of number of uh, 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 um, papers were uh, prepared from our users, together with uh, help from us. So you can see that uh, every year we had quite good number of publications with uh, good um, impact factors. And uh, the reason for this uh, good performance of the facilities, actually the method development or uh, our, uh, our contribution was to push the limits and uh, trying to extract as much as possible from, from the experimental side uh, and provide uh, these features or these, um, uh, let's say this, um, um, uh, good uh, uh, capabilities to the to the users. So here are some highlights uh, from the recent years. Uh, so uh, which are related to investigation of batteries, to uh, plant science, uh, magnetism, and here some material research. And uh, um, this is uh, related to uh, energy application. Uh, where we investigated electric steels. And all these good uh, highlights and uh, papers were uh, uh, able to produce uh, by uh, developing of new techniques, uh, which uh, uh, was actually quite important to implement and provide to the users. So uh, you see here that uh, we went in, in high resolution, in high speed, uh, in order to push the limits. 
we developed new methods uh, using uh, contrast related to a magnetic interaction, and we were able to reconstruct uh, the magnetic field uh, as a vector. And uh, with uh, uh, new um, methods where the phase, uh, let's say the uh, phase nature of, uh, of the neutron uh, was um, uh, related or, or was uh, approached, we were able to use even uh, interferometry. So uh, you see here that we are speaking about high resolution, high speed. So we are trying really to, uh, to push the limits and to, um, to get uh, to some uh, better uh, conditions uh, for, for the experiments of the users. And uh, this was uh, our main contribution. So being so extreme, is the, it is uh, something which we can relate to the Olympic motto. So uh, this is uh, just uh, faster, higher, and stronger. And which we, if we transfer this to, uh, to the neutron imaging field, then it should be faster, high resolution, and larger objects. So uh, this is uh, what we, we tried to do. And uh, today I'll focus in all these aspects. So starting with, uh, with the high resolution applications. So um, this is uh, one result which we achieved uh, uh, yeah, quite uh, ago. So it's about uh, nine years ago where we were able to uh, perform imaging with a resolution of about eight micrometers. And uh, this is quite a good achievement for, for neutrons and you see uh, why uh, we are very uh, proud with this. So finally, you can see here that we can resolve the, um, uh, the resolution pattern in quite good uh, uh, way. So here, uh, the distance between the, uh, the, the stripes is uh, of about, I think they're, uh, 10 micrometer, so uh, the resolution of uh, 8 micrometer was a quite good achievement. So when we speak about uh, resolution, we should uh, have in mind that it's not only the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, property of the detector, but uh, we should also have uh, good uh, experimental conditions for achieving of uh, good resolution. And uh, in case of neutrons, we have uh, the problem that the source is uh, isotropic source. In case of X-rays, it is possible to, to, uh, uh, to have really very small spot of uh, X-ray uh, radiation or in case of uh, uh, synchrotron uh, beam lines, you can uh, focus also the, the beam using uh, refractive lenses. Uh, in case of neutrons, it's very difficult to influence the trajectory of the neutrons because they, are, uh, they don't have uh, net charge and uh, using electro, elect, electrostatic or magnetic fields, it's uh, very difficult to focus the neutrons. So in this case, uh, in order to obtain re really sharp image or image with good resolution, we need to um, use some collimator geometry or uh, just uh, uh, point source geometry, where uh, actually to collimator, we can reduce uh, the size of the source and uh, using a large distance, we can reduce the geometrical blurring uh, at, on our detector. So you can see here that uh, this geometrical blurring, which we are uh, uh, obtaining on the detector uh, surface, on the detector plane, uh, depends on the distance between the object and the detector, and also uh, on the collimator properties which are defined by the distance of the, uh, from the pinhole to the sample L and also the diameter of the pinhole D. So this is the pinhole geometry, uh, uh, which is described here. And uh, uh, we can reduce uh, this geometrical blurring or increase our resolution 
when we keep very close distance between the object and the detector or uh, improve uh, the, uh, the properties of our collimator using large distance or small pinhole. Of course, uh, reducing the pinhole or using large distance uh, will reflect, this will reflect to the intensity which we have uh, at the sample position or the number of the neutrons which have this solid angle uh, uh, for reaching the sample. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, this will reflect to increased exposure time. So finally, uh, using uh, a certain pinhole is an uh, optimization question, where actually the uh, exposure time should be, uh, let's say, feasible for the experiment what we uh, are going to perform. So um, how to uh, measure the spatial resolution or what is the, uh, let's say, um, the, uh, the method, uh, how we can determine the resolution. So usually if you have, if we have a perfect resolution, uh, w w this means that the, uh, the beam is uh, really very good collimated or we have a parallel beam and uh, the detector has uh, infinity um, capability of taking uh, uh, signals uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, infinity uh, small pixel size. Then uh, if we are uh, visualizing, uh, for example, if we are taking picture of one edge, then the response will be really very sharp or, or just uh, uh, this step function. In the reality, it's not the case. So at least we have some pixelization of the detector. So, uh, and also if the beam is not uh, really well collimated. This means that uh, this step function will be smeared. And this D is actually uh, here, as, as shown here, is representing uh, first the uh, geometrical blurring from the uh, beam collimation, and also the, uh, let's say, the, um, in, uh, the property of the detector or resolution property of the detector, where the pixelization is also um, uh, giving uh, its contribution. So you can see here uh, uh, two different cases. If we have uh, a line spread function or edge spread function, actually the, uh, the measure for the resolution is the uh, edge response here between 10 and 90% of intensity, what we are getting here. And uh, this is a measure uh, actually for the, uh, for the resolution. If we are taking the uh, the first uh, derivative of this one, we'll get also the line spread function, where the measure for the resolution will be just the full width at the half maximum. So this is just uh, one, uh, let's say, impression how the resolution can be can be measured. So this means that if we if you have a sharp edge, you can put it in the beam, and uh, after analyzing the profile. Uh, through the through this edge, we can get some uh, first uh, preliminary estimation uh, for the resolution. So, how uh, we can uh, ex uh, or how uh, what are the, the the features or what are the uh, the experimental um, conditions which are influencing the uh, resolution? So. You can, you can uh, see here if we have such pattern uh, with uh, black and white uh, stripes or with black stripes, then uh, the imaging system will contribute to some, um, let's say, uh, smearing of this uh, pattern. And there are different contributions which we have. So it can be uh, the lens, uh, it can be the pixelization or the, uh, let's say, the sensor. And you see here, if, you, if we have a, a good uh, or a sufficient distance between the line pairs or these stripes, then uh, finally, uh, through the lens and also uh, through the pixelization of the detector, we will be able to 
resolve these two pairs, but if they are very close to each other, um, then uh, actually we'll have some overlap. And here in this region where we have overlap, this means that we have a smearing of the contrast. The contrast is defined just uh, by measuring of the uh, intensity for maximum and minimum when we uh, cross through this uh, picture of these wine pairs. And uh, uh, for the very tiny uh, distance between the line pairs, uh, then we have really reduced contrast. And here, this is a new method or uh, another method to measure resolution is just to see uh, 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 where or uh, how to say frequency dependent uh, reduce uh, contrast. So this is shown here. Uh, if we have 100% contrast, uh, this means that uh, increasing the frequency or the number of the line pairs per millimeter, uh, the contrast level is staying the same. So this means that uh, uh, the levels between high, uh, between maximum and minimum are staying the same. But uh, by reducing uh, the contrast and smearing this image, then we see that with increasing the number of the line pairs, we lose contrast. And uh, this can be seen here. Actually, this is the original pattern. And after um, a contribution from the, uh, from the detector, or let's say the response function from the detector is leading to a smearing of this uh, pattern. And uh, with the increase of the line pairs, we see that we lose contrast or the, uh, the difference between the maximum and minimum intensity is reduced. And uh, this is the definition of uh, um, a modulate transfer function where actually uh, the reduced contrast with the increased frequency is coming down to uh, 10%. So how this works in the reality? You see here, uh, this is uh, uh, one step edge or one edge, which uh, we uh, visualized with neutrons. So this is tin uh, foil of, uh, um, no, this was a tin foil of gadolinium, which we had in the beam. And uh, we measured this uh, with a pixel size of 15 micrometers. So uh, this is the signal which we obtained just by uh, measuring the intensity. And you see that it's quite sharp edge, but nevertheless, uh, there is a small broadening here. And after uh, taking uh, the MTF or the modulate transfer function, you see that with the, increase, uh, with the increase of the line pairs per millimeter, we reduce, we have a reduced contrast. At 10%, uh, at we have uh, uh, 20 uh, line pairs per millimeter, or this is corresponding to 25 micrometer. So here, uh, I would like to show you how this works. We uh, actually uh, 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 pro not produced, but uh, um, programmed uh, one plug-in, which we used for the estimation of the resolution uh, at our um, facility. And uh, usually when, when you're trying to uh, adjust, uh, for example, your lens and see uh, at what position we, you have the sharpest image, this means that at the end, you have a stack of images which are taken at different, uh, let's say, uh, adjustment steps of your lens. That's why uh, we uh, developed this tool or this plugin uh, in order to um, uh, estimate the uh, modulate transfer function for a stack of images. And you can see this here. So it's uh, it is also uh, given in the, uh, uh, it is also the link to this uh, plugin is provided in the, um, on the Indigo uh, website. So uh, you can, you can download it. 
And you see here, this is uh, this thin uh, gadolinium foil, which we measured uh, at different rotation steps of our lens. And um, what we can see here is that uh, in the beginning, we have quite sharp image. And with the rotation steps, the image is blurred. So this means that there is some optimum at some position, but it's very difficult to estimate this by eye. Therefore, um, we can just, let's say, take one line profile. Here, you see, we can take this line. And uh, then we can use the, um, the MTF plugin. Sorry, it is uh, because I have two screens and it's always um, displaced on the on the second screen and I should move it here. So um, it's very simple. You should uh, just uh, uh, define the pixel size which we have uh, at our detector and it was uh, seven micrometer. And so we want to have the contrast at 10% and the expected line pairs per millimeter is let's say 25. So this means if you click here, then yeah, then we have the response here. So uh, you see for the different pictures, we have here the line pairs per millimeter and also the calculated resolution. So uh, finally, you see that the second picture has the best uh, resolution and with increased, uh, let's say if, when we increase uh, the number of the uh, images, um, then um, the resolution is decreased. So uh, we have also the option to see the derivation and also the MTF. MTF. And you see here that it's quite noisy. Actually, um, uh, the result what we are we are we are getting here is uh, based on quite noisy uh, profile. Therefore, in order to increase um, or to improve the performance and uh, to improve the statistics of our measurement, we can actually um, uh, uh, use just. Uh, line profile, which is taking more, um, which is taking more uh, data points. So in image J, by double click on the line profile, we can uh, um, in extend the 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 the, uh, the width of this line, and this means that we are taking uh, all the points uh, along uh, the uh, line width. So uh, we are increasing or improving the uh, statistics uh, in, in our line profile. And it is also very important when we are taking this line profile that our line is really, uh, let's say normal or perpendicular to the surface of the edge. So here it is the case and we can calculate uh, the MTF again. So, um, here, then um, actually I should I should start actually yeah let me see ah uh, here I should define again the pixel size and the parameters so we have again the seven micrometer. And the expected light pairs per millimeter is about 25. So uh, here you see that we have much smoother profile. Uh, the resolution is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, is improved or the, the, the calculation of the resolution is improved and obtained MTF is much more reliable. So uh, this means that if you are going to really to estimate the resolution, it is uh, good to take uh, more points for the statistics. 
and also to have good orientation of your line profile. So uh, for, uh, for further um, uh, training, uh, I'll provide you also the experimental data so you can try this uh, by, on your own. And if you have questions, then you can, you can ask me uh, during the, the, the days uh, uh, in the, uh, at the school. So um, there are also some other uh, uh, or some other ways to estimate the resolution. And for this, there are certain patterns uh, which are used. So this is the Siemens star, which I showed in the beginning. And um, you, can, you can use this uh, pattern actually for very fast and uh, 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 let's say estimation and uh, um, qualitative uh, est est estimation of the resolution. So um, the, uh, here uh, you, can, you can claim that you have a resolution a uh, certain resolution when you can distinguish between the li line pairs uh, in the uh, uh, so far away from the from the uh, from the center of the of the pattern, and uh, in the case here we can say that we have resolution between 300, 200 and three hundred uh, micrometer, and this is this was our standard setup in the year two thousand six. So. Since this uh, uh, date, we invested a lot in our um, um, detector uh, systems to improve the resolution and uh, to uh, provide better conditions for the users. So the main things or the main um, components which are responsible for the resolution in such um, uh, detector system, uh, as shown here, uh, are the scintillator and the lens uh, of the uh, camera, which we're using for recording of the of the picture. Uh, I guess that my colleagues uh, has shown yesterday uh, the design of uh, neutron imaging detector system. If not, uh, we are just uh, converting the neutrons to visible light uh, through a scintillator, and then uh, we are observing the image on the scintillator through a mirror just by focusing uh, the, the, the camera uh, or focusing the, the picture uh, through, through the lens. And uh, by uh, just using um, uh, appropriate appropriate lenses, uh, then we can reduce uh, the pixel size and improve the resolution. So the cameras which we are using, so it's not uh, this is not advertisement for the CCD camera which we are use uh, which we used before because it's no more available uh, commercially. So it's an uh, old piece, but uh, anyway, it's just for your information to have some feeling how the detector looks like. Um, uh, so uh, it is quite bulky uh, device uh, and uh, it is uh, very sensitive uh, for light. You, here you can count even single photons. And we need this because uh, the efficiency of the scintillators and the neutron flux which we have are not uh, really very high. So finally, you are fighting with quite uh, a lot, a lot of noise, uh, statistical noise, uh, and also um, reduced efficiency of the scintillator. So finally, you need really uh, very uh, sensitive detectors, which are unfortunately very expensive. So uh, such kind of cameras uh, cost more than let's say twenty thousand uh, euro. So it's very delicate equipment. So uh, uh, for these uh, digital cameras, we are using uh, some commercial available lenses where uh, we can change uh, the effective pixel size. So you can see here that the pixel size, uh, which is uh, provided from the chip of the camera is about 13.5 micrometers. So different, there are different types of cameras. But uh, by using lens, uh, different lenses, so you can project uh, or you can zoom in or zoom out uh, on the scintillator, and then you have uh, uh, effective pixel sizes between 30, 50, and uh, more than this uh, micrometer. 
And uh, actually, this is uh, connected to the field of view or to the, to the area which are uh, uh, which are recording. Uh, and uh, uh, especially when you are going to high resolution, then uh, the field of view is becoming quite small. So at, if we are going to one-to-one -one imaging, then the field of view is just the projection of the chip over the scintillator area. And uh, then the size of the chip is uh, the limited, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, limitate. Uh, so this is the limitation for the uh, area which we can uh, observe uh, with this system. So uh, for the there are some um, uh, so, some let's say uh, um, um, special specialities of the neutron imaging or neutron detection uh, for imaging and uh, the the problem what we have is that uh, the neutrons cannot be uh, recorded or cannot be detected uh, in a direct way. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, usually the scintillators uh, which we're using, uh, especially in the area in the X-ray field, uh, so they're based on scintillating effect. So this means that we have interaction of the radiation with the electrons, and uh, due to the um, uh, due to the uh, change or due to uh, just um, uh, changing of the of the energy level of the electrons, uh, then uh, we have just emission of uh, visible light. So this uh, energy transfer is uh, just uh, uh, seen as emission of visible light. So uh, due to the fact that the neutrons are not able to interact with the electrons, they're interacting with uh, uh, with the nuclei of the um, of the atom. Uh, we are not able to uh, to have a scintillation uh, uh, using uh, type of uh, some material. Therefore, uh, we have a two step process or two stage process. Uh, and uh, for this, uh, the first stage is just to capture the neutron and use this nuclear reaction in order to produce uh, uh, secondary radiation, uh, like uh, let's say uh, alpha particles or uh, electrons, which actually on the second stage uh, can produce scintillating effect in 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 uh, scintillating uh, uh, in in a scintillating screen. So uh, this two stage effect uh, is actually the reason uh, why the neutron screens or the scintillating screens are two components. The first component uh, is uh, related to uh, high absorbing material, which is absorbing the neutrons and uh, the produced secondary radiation is interacting with the second component, which is uh, scintillating uh, material or material which has uh, high uh, probability for uh, scintillation. And then actually uh, the secondary radiation is producing uh, the visible light, which we can detect with our camera. The problem here is that uh, this two-stage process is reducing the resolution. So the light is not produced at the position where the neutron is captured, but at the position where the secondary radiation is, uh, is uh, produced. Uh, and, and also the light is produced, that uh, the secondary radiation is producing the light. And uh, usually uh, this diffusion or um, uh, this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, diffusion path for the secondary radiation is the limiting factor for, for the resolution in case of neutron imaging. So uh, here you can see some nuclear reactions which uh, we are using for producing of uh, this uh, secondary radiation for, uh, for the scintillation. And uh, the main... Um, 
the main reactions which uh, we are uh, implementing in our scintillating screens are uh, the uh, lithium, uh, the absorption of neutron by uh, lithium-6, where we have produ production of uh, alpha particle and triton. And this triton is actually uh, used uh, for the uh, scintillation. The alpha particles are also um, producing uh, scintillating effect, but uh, the mean free path of the triton is much bigger. And this is actually the, um, the limitation for the resolution. So the second reaction, which is quite important, or the second element, which we're using is uh, gadolinium-based scintillate, scintillators where converse electrons are produced. And in this case, uh, actually we have um, uh, not very big uh, mean free path for the converse electrons. And these types of scintillators are used for high resolution imaging. So you can see here the, uh, the uh, process of the, of the detection for neutrons in the scintillating screen. So this is typical mixture of six lithium fluoride for absorber and zinc sulfate for, for the scintillating uh, material. So um, you can see here that the neutron is first absorbed in the uh, six lithium fluoride. And then we have emission of triton and, uh, and uh, alpha particles. And this uh, secondary radiation, the triton and the alpha particles are producing, are interacting with the scintillating material and then visible light is produced. So the photon, uh, which is produced here, uh, we can detect uh, by our um, um, camera. So here are some facts uh, uh, related to the limitation of the resolutions. Actually, uh, the mean free path of this triton is of about uh, 50 to uh, 80 micrometer. And this is actually, um, let's say the limitation. So um, if we use very thin scintillators, then we can uh, go to resolution of 20 to 30 micrometer. And this is actually the, the, the best uh, resolution which we can achieve with this uh, type of uh, scintillators. What I mean with thin scintillators. So you can see here the effect of the scintillator thickness on the resolution just by imaging of the Siemens star. And, you, and here you see actually uh, the performance of uh, the detector sim, uh, system for uh, different thickness of scintillators. And uh, it is obvious that uh, at thicker scintillators, we lose the resolution. So uh, also the effect of the geometrical blurring is shown here. So here for the second, um, uh, for the second row here, uh, we use uh, the same scintillator thickness, but different distance between the uh, Siemens star and the detector. So at very short distances, we see that uh, we have uh, the best resolution and increasing the distance between the Siemens star and the scintillating screen, uh, the resolution is uh, quite um, uh, worse. Uh, so um, here, actually, I can show you uh, some um, method development related to improvement of the um, of our detector systems. Which steps we 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 used in order to improve the resolution. So uh, in the beginning, uh, we started with a uh, scintillator of thickness of 200 micrometer and pixel size of 100 micrometer. Therefore, it's not a surprise that uh, we could um, uh, detect or we could, could achieve a resolution between 200 and 300 micrometer. Of course, here the exposure times were quite um, uh, reasonable or quite uh, good. So with tw in 20 seconds, we had already a picture. So um, when we used a different type of lens uh, where the effective pixel size went down to 30 micrometer, then we see, you can see that the resolution is, was considerably improved. 
and uh, we were able to go on down to uh, already about 100 micrometer. And uh, for the next steps, uh, we tried uh, other type of scintillator, which was based on gadolinium um, material, uh, where the uh, thickness was only five micrometer. And in this case, you can see that we could uh, achieve resolution of about 60 micrometer, which is uh, not uh, a surprise because uh, usually the uh, the resolution is two times the pixel size because we need um, two pixels in order to distinguish between, let's say, um, uh, uh, between two stripes or uh, line pairs. And uh, for this, uh, this is the maximum resolution which we can achieve uh, with this system. In order to go further, so we should uh, do something in order to change uh, the pixel size to reduce the pixel size. And for this, we tried optical magnification. So in case of standard uh, imaging detector for neutron um, applications, we used uh, just uh, one lens and uh, just uh, we projected um, the scintillator over the chip by, by uh, using a lens. And um, in order to increase the resolution, we tried a different um, setup where um, two lenses were used for optical magnification. So if we have two lenses which are facing each other and uh, they are set to infinity, then you have the projection actually from one point through the, uh, through the two lenses uh, on the on the um, um, chip of the camera, where uh, optical magnification is possible. Actually, uh, at the end, the optical magnification is the ratio between the focal lengths of the two lenses. And if the first lens has a focal length of 105 millimeters and the second lens of uh, 50 uh, millimeter, then we have optical magnification of two. So this means with a pixel size of 13.5 micrometer, then uh, we will end up with 6.4 micrometer effective uh, pixel size, but with reduced uh, field of view. So here we, you see that uh, we are ending up with about 13.2 um, um, millimeter. So it's about one by one centimeter. In addition to this, we used very thin uh, gadolinium based scintillator. And uh, this uh, helped us to achieve a uh, much better resolution uh, of about, uh, let's say, 15 uh, micrometer. So we use this uh, for different uh, uh, applications. And one interesting application is uh, the field of fuel cells. Probably you know that uh, the fuel cells are uh, quite, um, um, uh, let's say, new uh, way or they are really um, very important for the development in the automotive industry where uh, cars can be um, driven by hydrogen, but uh, it is not burning the hydrogen, but uh, using the electrochemical um, uh, power, which uh, the hydrogen has, uh, where uh, actually um, there is, uh, um, splitting of the uh, hydrogen in uh, proton and electron. And uh, then uh, this uh, 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 electrochemical uh, reaction um, is going in a way that the proton is going through a proton exchange membrane. And um, uh, the electrons uh, are uh, used for the um, electricity production. From the other side, uh, we have recombination where the protons together with the electrons and uh, some oxygen from the air uh, produce water. So this is a very clean way of producing electricity and uh, using uh, hydrogen uh, for this. Uh, so the output product is water. But uh, the problem of this device is uh, 
First, if the proton exchange membrane is becoming dry, then the proton conductivity goes down. But in addition to this, uh, actually, if we have uh, too much uh, production of water, then, uh, okay, let me go to the next slide. Uh, then this channel will be blocked and we uh, have uh, not enough uh, oxygen for the reaction. So the performance of the fuel cell drops down. Therefore, uh, there was an idea from uh, uh, some industrial partner to make some good organization of the uh, gas diffusion layer here, where we have uh, two um, flows. In one side, we have water flow uh, through the porous media in order to uh, just get the water out or, or, or away from the uh, area of reaction. And the other flow is uh, just gas flow of uh, oxygen, which we need for the reaction. So we can try uh, some uh, uh, this kind of uh, geometry, some drainage, where um, um, if we uh, use some hydrophobic material for the uh, for the porous structure, then the water will be forced uh, to follow the channels. And then we have free area for the gas flow for the reaction. So this was just uh, a try to organize a bit better um, the, the flows in this gas diffusion layer. So for this, we performed some uh, neutron tomography imaging in order to observe where is the water at the operation of the fuel cell. And for this, we, we needed uh, quite high resolution because the hose or the diameter of the hose was about uh, 80 micrometer. So the high resolution tomography, which we performed, has shown us that the water is not in the hole, but around the hole, which was not expected because uh, the material we used for this porous media was hydrophobic. And we didn't expect that the water will be uh, uh, acc uh, accumulated in the, in the material itself. So uh, this result was quite disturbing. And we performed some additional study where um, it was found out that the drilling process with the laser is um, leading to some overheating of the material and uh, this, the heat affected zone changes its property from hydrophobic to hydrophilic. And finally, we can have the water actually here uh, uh, in the walls of, this, um, of these channels. So uh, at the end, we were able to perform um, a tomography experiment with uh, high resolution synchrotron radiation where the contrast for water is very weak. But anyway, it was possible to see that um, actually uh, the water, uh, the distribution of the water for two types of uh, production of these holes with laser perforation, and mechanical perforation. And you can see definitely that uh, in case of laser perforation, the water is here around the channel. And here you can see very well with the mechanical perf uh, mechanic perforation that the, even we have some droplet and the water is clearly staying in the channel. And this helped actually to increase the performance of the, of the fuel cells by, by around 40%. So finally, the, uh, the main result or the very important uh, result here was provided by the, by the neutron um, tomography. So here, um, actually having high resolution is not only um, observing, uh, just using it for uh, neutron investigations, but it is also a, a big advantage of combining uh, X-ray with the neutron imaging, because uh, then we can match the same type of resolution using the two probes. The X-rays, uh, uh, can be detected with really very high resolution. And in this way, increasing the resolution for the neutron investigation, then we can have um, uh, uh, complementary information or complementary uh, uh, 3D data, which can be merged together. And in this way, uh, we can perform our dual mode imaging uh, with much better um, 
uh, uh, capability or much better um, quality. So here you see, for example, uh, the X-ray and neutron image of uh, um, uh, sand with water, or this is different uh, 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 sand which was compacted. And uh, it was interesting to see uh, how the water distribution uh, looks like in, in different uh, uh, stages, stages of uh, compactation. So the pixel size was similar for the X-rays and the neutrons. And performing tomography, we can say see the complementary contrast that uh, X-rays are seeing the silicon, uh, uh, silicon dioxide or the sand uh, uh, corns. And uh, the neutrons see very good the water actually between the sand. So combining the X-rays and neutrons, it is possible to perform some statistical study and uh, see, uh, for example, uh, the coordination number for the, the neighbors for of each sand corn. We can see the water uh, or the, the, the areas of contacts and uh, also to uh, uh, estimate uh, the amount of water or where the water is presented. So um, the single tomography using neutrons or X-ray will be not able really to uh, to get this uh, uh, system in such a detail. So we can go even to uh, some um, um, uh, uh, energy application um, or energy uh, applications uh, uh, examples where uh, we want to see uh, the performance of lithium battery. So this is uh, uh, lithium uh, or better, which is um, based on manganese oxide uh, electrode. And uh, what is very interesting is the lithium intercalation or the lithium diffusion in the, in the electrode, in the manganese oxide electrode. And here we can combine the uh, high resolution uh, of, uh, of the X-rays with the uh, complementary contrast provided by the uh, neutrons where we can see the distribution of the lithium. Here we used also some innovation where the, this curved or, or let's say rolled structure can be unrolled. And uh, in this way, we can uh, investigate just planar structures, which is, which is much uh, convenient, much more convenient for the investigation. So what we can see here is how the lithium is uh, uh, the lithium diffusion in the in the electrode. So you can see here with the time, the here the lithium is the dark area. So this means we have quite uh, low attenuation uh, for X-rays, and here with neutrons, it's uh, the complementary contrast. We have high attenuation for the neutrons and. Uh, low attenuation for the electrode, manganese-based electrode. And with the time, we can see uh, how the uh, lithium um, is uh, decreasing. The amount of lithium is decreasing. The electrode is expanding. And uh, we have some um, uh, intercalation of uh, lithium in the, in the electrode. This can be studied also with X-rays and uh, neutrons. So you see here how the thickness of the electrode changed with the capacity. And here, this is the contrast uh, related to the lithium consumption with uh, uh, X-rays and neutrons. So we have complementary contrast. Unrolling the electrode, we can see also uh, the lithium uh, intercalation with the time. So you can see starting from, from the top to the bottom, you see that we have brighter areas and this is just the areas where we have uh, more lithium di uh, diffusion in the, in the electrode. So this means that combining uh, the X-rays and neutrons, we can investigate such complex systems and uh, even uh, going, pushing the limit of uh, temporal resolution, then it is possible in 3D to investigate the dynamics in, the, in such kind of system. So this is a discharge of this um, uh, type of battery. Uh, and uh, what we see here is how the electrolyte is consumed, uh, how here the lithium is uh, uh, the lithium intercalating in the in the electrodes. 
So uh, in case of uh, um, time dependent uh, tomography, uh, we can investigate uh, in 3D the process. We can see uh, in 3D the lithium consumption in the battery. So all the changes which are related uh, to the electrochemical process can be investigated or uh, um, visualized in 3D. Here, the time resolution was about 7.5 minutes per tomography with a pixel size of eight micrometers. So here, this experiment was performed at ILL with really very high intensity, which is available there. I have a question about the yeah. uh, in-situ consuming yeah. of the electrolyte. How possible is it to let it, the battery run while it's rotating in the X-ray and neutron beam? Because the, the sample has the, the battery has to be rotated. Exactly. Right. So there there they, uh, there are some devices known as slip ring. So this means you have two cylinders uh, mm -hmm. where the upper cylinder can rotate and the contacts, uh, for example, for the uh, for the battery are guided through uh, some rings which are connecting um, radially. So in this case, the upper part of the cylinder can rotate and the down part uh, can stay. And then uh, the contacts uh, are connected to the battery with the upper part. And on the bottom part, you have the contacts which are staying, staying static. So in this way, uh, you can have a really, um, uh, let's say, uh, 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 transfer of the contacts uh, to the battery uh, without having the problem of twisting the cables or, or whatever. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Good, so pushing the limit of the temporal resolution here, uh, the main component is the camera. So we should have uh, really high speed. So this is 30 frames per second, or uh, uh, we can even push it to 100 frames per second or uh, 10 milliseconds. So this is very important for such kind of in investigation. This is uh, just a uh, two component uh, flow uh, of uh, water or of air in water. And you see here the dark is water and the bright is air because it's uh, just radiography in transmission. And uh, this study was performed by our colleagues in at PSI. So uh, they use high speed camera and here with 800 frames per second, you can see the uh, two flow uh, pattern um, of air in, in water. So uh, going to 3D, so what I have shown, uh, we can investigate the water uptake in plants. For this, we can use just contrast agent D2O where the uh, absorption is much less for neutrons. And here with 10 seconds per tomography, we can see uh, how the D2O, which is transparent, is pushing the, uh, the light wa water uh, to the top. And we can observe this in 3D. And after this, this tracer, the heavy water, can be used for uh, estimation of the activity of the roots. So you see that some roots are losing contrast because the heavy water is uptaken by the roots and uh, then the uh, absorption property of these uh, roots is uh, uh, decreasing. So I also have a question here, yeah. sorry. So, uh, so look at these four pictures, uh, the plant wrapped by the water, heavy water. Are these waters, the modeling of the mole water molecule or is, are these actually the 3D images we get from the Neutron. These are the three D images which are uh, getting from the neutrons. So this okay. means this means that every ten seconds uh, you have a tomography. So these are three hundred images over ten seconds. So uh, the exposure time was uh, just uh, I think thirty milliseconds or something like this. Okay. And um, so that's why I, I wanted to show you how this looks in the reality. So uh, few uh, or last year we were able to perform 1.5 second tomography at ILL with their high flux. And this is how this looks in the reality. So this is the speed of, this, let's say, 1.5 seconds over 180 degrees. So this is just for your uh, feeling 
uh, how how is the speed and that we don't have really a problem with the uh, uh, centrifugal forces uh, for the water. So this is quite moderate speed. And then uh, we can investigate uh, the water uptake uh, in the plant with 3D. So large samples, uh, of course, uh, we can investigate uh, samples which fit in the filter view. But if not, then we can scan through, scan through the filter view. This is one uh, sculpture from India. So, uh, and uh, these are the first examples in the, in the uh, uh, history for producing such big uh, uh, casted uh, figures. Uh, they were produced somehow um, uh, in uh, 700 uh, in the year uh, 1000 after Christus and uh, also uh, some long uh, samples like this um, um, Japanese bowl so uh, the example with this was uh, uh, so the bowl was 2.5 meters so we should put it in a, some holder and then scan uh, just step by step over its uh, uh, along its uh, um, uh, so uh, um, length, and finally uh, we can stitch all these uh, volumes together so that we have a full picture of the electric ball uh, of the, sorry of the Japanese ball in 3D, and we can see that it's manufactured by uh, different pieces of wood. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of wood with different uh, mechanical properties or el elastic properties in order to have uh, really uh, very high um, uh, performance of the ball. So uh, the next application is to investigate uh, uh, some lead ingots, which uh, are coming from Roman time, from some shipwrecks, uh, which are sunk uh, around uh, uh, Syracuse. Uh, and uh, it was interesting to find out uh, the origin or where these uh, ingots are coming from. This was the way of transporting lead material in the Roman time with ships from the areas of just uh, where this was uh, uh, gained. And um, the good thing is that all these ingots were stamped uh, with the name of the manufacturer so that we can backtrace uh, the, the, uh, the area where this is coming from. But uh, after, let's say, thousands of years in the salt water, these uh, ingots are completely corroded. So we can see that there is some stamp here or area of stamping, but uh, it's not possible really to read anything because there is a very thick corrosion layer. So. 10 centimeter of lead is really uh, no way to transmit with X-rays, but the neutrons can transmit lead quite easily. So this, this uh, sample is very heavy. It's about uh, 50 kilogram. Put it in, to put it on the beam line and to investigate it was quite demanding work. But finally, when we re, uh, remove the corrosion layer, then it's possible to read really uh, on, on, on below uh, what is the, uh, what was the, um, uh, the name of the manufacturer and uh, this in this case this was Rossini and uh, also we were able here in the middle to reconstruct it uh, his trademark it's a dolphin so finally together with the archaeologists we could find out that it's coming from Cartagen. So uh, at that time the ship was just uh, um, uh, sunk uh, after some fire on the on the ship and uh, um, after thousands of years it was able we were able to reconstruct where it's coming from. So uh, uh, what is why this figure is so interesting because it's that uh, due to the uh, some primitive casting it was it had a lot of porosity we found out that uh, it has a lot of porosity and even the curators of the museum was were quite disturbed that it can break after that so they were really uh, very uh, surprised to see this. But observing this image, you can even make some uh, 
uh, let's say, suggestion how the figure was in which position uh, the figure uh, cooled down after the casting, because here you have much bigger bubbles than here. So this means that the face was uh, on the floor and uh, with the time, uh, actually, it starts to solidificate where the, uh, the large bubbles went to the back. So uh, here we, there were speculations that the old Indian uh, um, um, manufacturer used this on a purpose in order to make it uh, light, much more light uh, for transportation because they used these figures in, in some uh, uh, street, uh, how to say, um, uh, manifestation or whatever in some religious, uh, uh, days uh, for religious purposes and uh, then having this porosity it makes the figure much lighter but now uh, the, the data are still under processing and uh, we are uh, in contact with the colleagues from the Rijk Museum in Amsterdam so I'm over the time and with this I want to thank you for your attention